Hi folks, Gavosh here from the Senior Dev. And today we are back with Bogdan and we're going to go through seven senior front-end interview questions. We're going to cover a bunch of very wide topics from authentication all the way towards the shadow DOM and down to deployment. This is for you if you are a front-end developer interviewing right now and looking to get hired as a mid-level or senior front-end engineer. Well, our first question for today is what are JSON Web Tokens? JVTs, and how are they used for authentication in a modern front-end application? So basically the question is, what are JSON Web Tokens, basically JVT? So in the context of web out, you use JVTs to authenticate with the backend. So as a client, let's say I want to make some requests to certain resources that are require some privileges. I'll have to authenticate and authorize to be able to have access to that. So basically when I send a request over to my backend service, I usually include in the authorization header a JVT and then the back and will verify that JVT with what we call an identity server. So that would be a third party, either maintain or purchase. So let me just, so as a client, I include the JVT, the backend will verify that in, with the identity server and then return the resources to me if I have access to them. If I want to get a token, I usually myself as a client would redirect the user to identity server. The user would authenticate by giving their credentials, even that it's usually, you know, email, password or a multi-factor out, and then they would obtain like I would obtain a token and then I would use that to exchange requests with the backend. Now, can I, as a client, have access to that token? Well, depends. It really depends how we implement this, but it would be not a very good practice to give the client JavaScript access to the JVT because of um, cross-site scripting attacks, so XSS attacks. What will happen is that attackers that are able to inject JavaScript in a client are able to read, for example, a JVT from local storage, and then they could use it to act on behalf of the user. So it's a very good practice to actually persist the JVT in an HTTP-only cookie. And so nobody on the front end is being able to access it. As a client, if I need user information, I would just make a request to get user. The backend would read the JVT, and based on the JVT, they would return me the user info. Which brings us to the second question. I mean, you, you talked about storing this in an HTTP-only cookie. What would be the difference if we choose to store our... GVT token in local storage or um, any other way to store it? Sure. So basically we have cookies, right? Where we could store it. We could store in local storage um, or session storage. But the thing with session storage is that it's not persistent enough. It will be cleared when, if I recall well, when you close the browser window. So it's not very good for auth, which we usually don't want the user to re-authenticate every time they close the browser. And local storage, it's accessible to JavaScript. So an attacker could, if they have access to, or if they can inject scripts into our website, imagine somebody installs a, a Chrome extension that um, it's malicious. They could actually read the JVT. So the best way is to do it in cookies. And in this case, HTTP only cookies, and you can even make them HTTPS only. And so JavaScript, nobody's able from the front end to access them, but they are able to send requests and cookies are automatically included in any request we send. And with those requests, they are able to get back user data and then access any of the backend services because they're all carrying the cookie. Awesome. Let's move on to the next question. And we're going to talk about monitoring a very core topic to front-end engineering as a whole. Bogdan, what tools have you used and would you be using to monitor a front-end application? And talking about monitoring, what metrics would you focus on when monitoring a front-end application and why? Um, so I guess my first question would be what what kind of front-end application? Let's focus on an e-commerce use case where you have product pages, you have catalog pages, in performance, it's important. SEO, it's also important. If it's e-commerce, um, the project I've been working on, we'd probably need to, first of all, monitor for errors, like if there's an exception. And for that, we can use tools like Sentry. Basically, when there's an exception on the on the client side, or so, some user gets it, we get an email and there's an alerting system in that. So whoever it's on call from our team would be able to deal with that. They're able to have stack traces. They're able to reproduce the error. It tells us like on what 
operating system it happened? Was it a mobile device and so on? So that's critical. That's a must have. I would also probably want to have performance metrics in terms of what are the core web vitals we're exper experiencing. So what is the real loading speed our users uh, experiment when they land on the page? I would probably look for metrics like if it's an e-commerce website, in the first content of the paint, I would look for the speed index and I would probably look for the cumulative layout shift. And all those will tell us, hey, it's our application healthy. Does it load fast? So these are the two most important ones. And if we're doing server-side rendering, we also would probably need a server-side monitoring component. We basically want to monitor, you know, the APU metrics, as they call them, that's the application machine metrics, the CPU, the memory. And probably we also want to know like requests coming in, requests coming out, average response time. This will be more back-end focus. But coming back to the front-end, you probably would also need, or, or our product and marketing would also need some analytics. So I would look at something like Google Analytics. And uh, I know Google Analytics is not the best, but it's the industry standard. And it's one of the easiest to implement. Understood. So we're talking about uh, Sentry, then looking into Google Analytics. Mm -hmm. Anything else you would add to the mix? No, I think if we have kind of usage and traffic analytics um, covered, we have our performance metrics and we have an alerting system in place, you should be good to go. Folks, for the ones watching us, if you are a software engineer interviewing in the current market, or if you're simply interested in getting better, make sure you check out the free technical assessment that you can find in the comments where you're going to have to invest about 10 minutes of your time, answer a few questions, and you will get a full analysis on your technical gaps. And most importantly, what you should be focusing on next to level up your skills to a senior level and beyond. Now, Bogdan, we're going to move on with the next question, which is very specific, very niche to the front end. Can you explain the shadow DOM. When and why would you use it? Sure. So um, basically the shadow DOM is a, you can think of it as a, as an extra subsection of the DOM we can create to declare our CSS variables. And the main advantage there would be encapsulation and isolation in the sense of whatever it's in that shadow DOM, it's not accessible to the rest of the DOM. So we can easily use any kind of CSS class without having the fear of a conflict in a big application. However, um, I feel like in production application, it's not, it's not so useful in our day to day work unless you're building your own component library and you want to ship that and you want to make sure there's no conflicts with the global application. The problem with the shadow DOM, it's usually, it's kind of complex, right? We, it, it adds complexity. It will decrease performance. There's more work to the browsers to, to interpret it. It's also not compatible with all browsers. So if you're using, if you have users that use maybe Internet Explorer or older versions of the browsers, they might not be able to to use it, and it cannot be really polyfilled. Like right? this is not one of those JavaScript features that you can just polyfill and you're done. You can't really polyfill it. And the other thing is, I mean. The Shadow DOM would be really useful if you want to make something look the same regardless of the browser. So imagine you are building a drop-down component. Usually those components, they inherit a lot from the native browsers. So a drop-down will look slightly different on Chrome than it looks in Safari. With Shadow DOM, you really make sure you do not inherit any of those styles. You have your own styles and it looks consistent, but it's also a lot more work on the developer because there's no inherit styles. So you really have to declare everything. Yeah, I mean, there are performance drawbacks, but given the global nature of CSS as a language where everything is global. If we're talking about a micro frontends scenario, would you recommend using something like the Shadow DOM or what would be any an alternative, right? If we have different front-end applications that are building up together into one, you know, if there is one developer in a team that's using the same class as another developer in another team for a different service, and those 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 micro front-ends will compose in one big front-end, how do we avoid conflicts without using wit and without sh using the shadow DOM? Sure. So there's, there's different ways to avoid conflicts. And one of the easiest is by using CSS in JS. Basically, your, your module bundler will take up your CSS classes and add a prefix or suffix or hash them all together into a unique hash based on your file path. And so there won't be any conflicts. And I know this, this CSS conflicts used to be a problem back in the days when we didn't have uh, CSS modules. But now with CSS modules and CSS in JS, it's just a lot easier to avoid conflicts without having to over-engineer our front end. So to be very honest, unless you really need a, you have a very specific use case, like you're building a specific 
big UI component you want it to be usable maybe you're building open source I do not think the Shadow Dome it's the best choice for you and it will be a lot of over engineer it's something new we need to learn it will decrease performance I think it comes with a lot of drawbacks and um, you can solve the conflicts name with CSS modules okay Bogdan on to the next question and we can talk about server side rendering so in the context of server-side rendering what is hydration sure so hydration is basically whenever we finished rendering on the server we have our html markup and we deliver that to the user right so they see our web page and it's all rendered but they can't really interact with it until we attach our um our actual virtual dom and, and even handlers to it and so if you're using any of the modern javascript frameworks like angular or svelte or react or even Vue, and you're doing server-side rendering there it's always a hydration phase when we interpret the javascript coming from the back end and we attach that to the existing html structure so that would be hydration until hydration doesn't happen the page won't be interactive so the users can see something but they might click and nothing happens and you get this click rage now how would you avoid issues with mismatch content doing hydration so most of server-side rendering already have those things built in and they have like hydration warnings but if you're hydrating you want to avoid things like using for example timestamps in your server in the html because the timestamp on the server would be different from the one on the client so if you really need to generate the timestamp and show it to the user you can do it in a if you're using React, you can do it in a use effect hook and you make sure it's only client side rendered. And on the other hand, you really want to use the same HTML on the client as on the server. So it kind of has to look the same. Uh, you really want to try to avoid to generate or to hash any value when you're rendering on the server because you might get a totally different value when you're on the client. Uh, usually this is something that us as developers don't have to care too much about it because frameworks like Next.js solve it for us. But it's good to know. Right. Whether you, you know, if you run into hydration problems, it's good to at least be able to diagnose what's happening. Now, mm -hmm. we're going to move on with a question about deployment. Open scope question. Feel free to go as deep as you want, but how would you deploy a front-end application? Sure. So I think it pretty much depends on what the infrastructure we're using. Um, would you like me to go into depth into how we do it over a cloud system or are we looking more at, can, can I pick whatever I want? Um, pick whatever you want, but keep in mind, let's say, for example, we are quite sensitive about scalability. We start with a bunch of users, but then our service and company is going faster and faster. And also, I want you to think of going back to the e-commerce use case. If we have, for example, we, we sponsor some commercials on, on TV and we have some certain spikes of traffic. Mm -hmm. How can we also provision for that? Um, sure. It's the application client side only, or is there a server component, like a server side and an application? Let's start with client side first, and then we can talk about the server side use case as well. Sure. I mean, if it's only client side, then we only need to like do a static deployment. So this is basically hosting some static files in blob storage um like block storage something like amazon s3 for example let's put it that way so let me i would probably start with that if if we're running amazon or whatever you whatever service you're running usually it provides a way for you to do that so i'm gonna add here s3 but it could be anything it doesn't have to be amazon specific so we could upload our files there and then probably i would have some cdn infrastructure in front of it so i know amazon has cloudfront and so basically cloud cloudfront will sit in front of it and distribute this on an edge in edge locations all around the world so we make sure that our users um, do not have any latency so our users come in here they get redirected to the closest edge location as they call it which is a location where they duplicated all our content and they can easily access it no latency um, so this would be the most basic deployment basically some static storage with a cdn in front of it and in this case added s3 and CloudFront from it for AWS. Okay, Bogdan, and what about if the application was server-side rendered? Server-side rendering, it's a bit more complex because we need a compute, we need a server that actually handles that. You mentioned there will be a lot of users. So if we have SSR, as they call it, we need some compute power. So I know nowadays you could even deploy on things like Vercel or Netlify if you want to one-click deployment and they have distributed compute. But if you go for the traditional cloud way, you'd probably need either an EC2 instance or a container running or in the worst case a, a lambda function that will actually 
you know, run when the users go in, render our application on the server. And I'll still use S3 and CloudFront for, for our static assets. So basically the way that will look like is that, uh, give me a second. So basically we would have our users and they would come in here. That would be our server. And basically our server will kind of, so the users, they come in here. So our users go to our server, but they will also be able to request static assets from CloudFront and S3. So we would still use that infrastructure, but we'd have a server. And um, in this case, I'll probably go for a, it depends on the team setup, of course, um, but in modern, most modern teams have a container, uh, container system here where we can containerize and deploy something like Fargate or AWS. I worked with those in the past, or you could also go for something simpler like a Lambda. Now you mentioned it's an e-commerce. So Lambda probably is not that good because it's a starting time for Lambda. So maybe you want to go, you know, traditionally with a EC2 instances that have a load balancer and they can scale. But that would be more like the backend kind of side of it. Yeah, so you would go, so you would go, so basically with SSR, you would move towards a more traditional deployment. It isn't as easy as just deploying your, your bundle JavaScript as a static asset and, and scale to the moon and back using S3, right? Not at all. Yeah, because... It's also, if you have users from different geographies, the server is usually located in one place. So you add a lot of latency to the equation. And what Vercel, I think, did and all those modern deployments for, for server-side rendered is that they deploy, they distribute in the same way CloudFront distributes your static assets, they distribute your compute. But again, it's it's a fairly complex kind of setup. It will definitely add more complexity to the deployment if we do server-side rendering. One of the drawbacks of SSR, just keep it in mind. Cool, back to the final question in this series. Give me an example of a tricky production bug you had to fix and how you went about it. Tricky production bug. Okay, so let me think. Well, to go with the front-end example, I think it was around three or four years ago, we were, be we were building a very heavy, you can think of it as a widget component that was using a lot of data. And a lot of it was um, calculation data. So we were giving customers like an instant quote on a very complex uh, heating system. And what happened is I think one of the developers um, was relying on the order of the elements in an array for a computation. So we had an array of, you can think of them as prices, and it would always rely on the second element being there and being a certain price. And I think I spent around three days um, once because um, people were getting a different price in Safari than in Firefox. And I think Google Chrome was the same price as Safari, but different from Firefox. And it was like impossible to know. Like we, we look at all the data that was coming to the front end, it was exactly the same, exact same inputs, different price. And I think what I found out after a while is that the order in, but the default order of the array was different in Firefox for some reason, in some versions of Firefox. And that's why um, the array was totally different. I think it was a, a big um, programming error there because whenever we have the we, we don't want to rely on the order of things in an array. If you if you really want to access something um, and it has always to be that something, you just put it in a key value pair in an object. Using an array there was misleading. And uh, I think it was around three days of work to actually debug the whole thing on the client side there to reproduce it and understand, oh, it's actually this array that's creating the problem. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. It feels more like a malpractice <laughs> in the back end. And if you're a back end engineer, keep this in mind, this kind of stuff can get you fired. Well, that, that generated a production bug. But there's an interesting thing out there that uh, front-end engineers have to deal with on a daily basis, which is supporting different browsers and different versions of those browsers, as well as even mobile clients. Right? This is one of the why front-end is so hard, leaving aside the user, re user requirements, which are always increasing. With that being said, for the people watching us, as Bogdan did, it's good if you're interviewing right now to have a bunch of stories ready, whether that's a production bug, whether that's a team conflict, uh, just write them down because they can come up in interviews and people want to see what you did about it, what was the impact, how you found the solution. With that being said, Bogdan, thank you very much. Very interesting set of interviews. Folks, for the one watching us, if you're interviewing or if you simply want to get better, check out the technical assessment and find out what your gaps are. With that being said, once again, thank you, Bogdan, and we will see you folks in the next one.